All right, good afternoon, everyone. We want to, we want to thank uh, Luciana Mitchell. Mitchell? Uh, she is a public health educator, educator, and a member specialist with over 25 years of experience in brain health, memory, and dementia care. Luciana is currently uh, served as the director of community services for Vida Alamar, where she provides family support and health education. She's also the author of A Head with Dementia, a, a book, a couple of books, One Romeo, which is also in Spanish, okay? Un Paso Adelante de la Demencia, and A Head of Memory Loss. Uh, today's topic is the addressing fear and anxiety in dementia patients. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for having me here. Uh, I have a, a couple of hand, well, just one actually handout that I will be working of the presentation from the information here. And I have one left. Is there anybody who hasn't received a copy who would like one? Is the last one? Here. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, thank you for the introduction. I've been working with memory loss and the nation patients for nearly 30 years now. And um, we've learned some lessons, um, some lessons on the contact with the patients with dementia. Others reported by the caregivers, sometimes the caregivers are family members or professional caregivers. And the, the best thing to have in mind when working with people who have cognitive disability is that at that encounter that you're having, if you have another encounter with another patient before or you have experience, throw it all away. Every encounter is going to be unique, is going to be maybe with unexpected consequences, and uh, you don't know what's gonna be coming back to you. What we can do is maximize our chances of success by monitoring our own address, how you come to the patient, and how you talk to the patient. So this is what we're going to talk about today, in terms of keeping a person from escalating anxiety, from escalating uh, a behavior that might put that person at risk and put your own health at risk. So a person who is agitated, who is angry and confused will react very negatively if they feel any threat from you. And you may be coming with the best of intentions to help this person, but that's not what they are perceiving. So the information is contained in this handout here. It's called Angry and Agitated Behavior. And it's not written by me. It's from a book called Understanding Difficult Behaviors, which is like our little Bible in terms of practical information on how to deal with dementia patients. So let's first start thinking of what it is a dementia patient. I work at Villa Alamar. Any guys, if you want to come in? I think there's room for more people. You don't have to be out there. <laughs> so what is a dementia patient? Not every patient that you have cognitive decline will come with a dementia diagnosis. A dementia diagnosis is very specific. It's a person who is having, one, memory problems, two, other cognitive problems, and three, those problems are interfering with their ability to live their normal lives, whatever their normal lives are. So, that it will be uh, subject to the interpretation of the doctor who is doing the diagnosis and also subject to variations as far as what are these activities that are being interrupted. So for example, 
If I am a farmer who has been doing every single day the same thing, the same routine, every single day of my life for let's say 60 years, every day I do the same thing. I milk the same cow or I plow the same fields or whatever it is that farmers do because I'm not a farmer. I don't know what farmers really do. But you can expect that every day is the same thing except for Sunday because there's some activities on Sunday. That person, if they have a cognitive decline, it's not going to be dementia for a long time because every single day is the same. And you can ask a person, what did you do yesterday? Well, I mean, milk the cow. They milk the cow every day. So it's going to take a lot longer for the cognitive decline to be severe enough to interfere with his activities. But the same kind of damage in a person who has a more complicated life, and normally I compare with soccer moms, and uh, soccer moms have a really difficult life. They are managing their work schedule, they are managing their children's education, their social lives and games and homework, and they are running from one place to another, taking their children. That's not easy. The same damage that does not appear much prominent on a farmer, on a soccer mom, would be completely paralyzing. She wouldn't be able to continue doing what she does with the same damage because every day is different. So dementia is a subjective diagnosis and is declared by a doctor. However, not every patient who will come to you, especially in a skilled nursing, uh, such as what we have here, they will have that, that diagnosis. But you will notice by the symptoms. And the symptoms are going to be aggravated by the conditions. So let's take a look of what the symptoms, uh, what would be aggravating for a person in a, even if they don't have a dementia diagnosis. So we have, can look at the causes here on your handout. Say psychological and medical causes. Fatigue, a time of request. Fatigue, which ones of your patients are fatigued? Mostly, it's all of them, right? Disruption of the sleep pattern. So a person is not sleeping well, of course, they are out of their environment. Physical discomfort or pain, fever, illness, something in their bodies that's causing the discomfort. Loss of control over behaviors. Loss of control. Anybody who is in a assisted living, a hospital, or a skilled nursing, they are suffering from loss of control by default. That's, that's what's happening just in the essence of it. Maybe they are having adverse side effects of medication, impaired vision, and on top of it, they may also be suffering from hallucinations. So how many of those factors can you see on an average person who is you know, with, without dementia in under your care. You know, most of them are suffering from, if not all, most of those conditions. And then there's the environmental causes, sensory overload, I am out of my environment. There's a lot of people coming and going. There's sounds, there are people groaning, there are beeping. That people coming and asking you questions that you're unfamiliar with, it makes you uncomfortable. Um, sudden movements, noises that you can't, you can't uh, relate to. Feeling lost, insecure, feeling forgotten, especially on the past few months where the families couldn't come and visit their loved ones. They don't feel just forgotten, they feel abandonment. They feel that they are left behind or difficulty to adjusting to the different lighting. lighting. So all these factors together 
in a normal person are upsetting, They're, they will cause you to be very nervous, anxious, and, and despondent. But in a person with dementia, diagnosed or not, they can't control, they can't reason, they don't know why they are here. So how can they cope not knowing on how to entertain themselves or even know why they are here? Many times their coping mechanism comes in actions such as being violent towards the care providers. Sometimes it's anxiety, pacing around the environment and, and fighting and screaming and groaning and making noises. And we are the ones who have to deal with that. Sometimes the doctors will make will provide medications that will help, but the medications don't help all the time, and we all know that. And, and sometimes the medications can make it even worse, depending on the kind of dementia the person is suffering. So there is a, a huge adjustment process for the person, for the staff, and, and it's the safety of everybody who is at risk here the safety of the patients and the staff as well, as, uh, as a group. So, there are some hints here on how to deal with this, but I would like to pay attention on more on how to approach people who are suffering from disturbances in a care setting event, uh, environment. So for a person with dementia, the most, the most, the biggest fear that they have is fear of abandonment. And that's it, any, anywhere. Uh, where I work, Villa Lamar, they live there, they have the run of the house, they walk all over their trees and patios and places to go, music and things to do and they're still afraid of abandonment. So they have all the nurturing, nobody's forcing them to do anything they don't want, but the fear of abandonment doesn't go away. So we are always trying to reinforce that. In a more clinical setting, this is even worse. Why am I doing here? And you may have noticed, sometimes you will have people who have a broken leg and they don't understand why they are here. You will also see that some people who are um, with dementia or very severe cognition uh, impairment, you know, they might be on a wheelchair for the first time in their lives. They can't remember they are in a wheelchair and they keep trying to get out of the wheelchair, falling and hurting themselves. So all that is a product of this agitation. And Besides the medication, which I thoroughly believe medication is necessary, must be used, and it must be used with a lot of um, care and supervision from doctors, but the approach that each one of us offer is unique and essential to a good outcome of that interaction. So imagine, imagine how you deal with this every day bathing somebody who doesn't understand why you are there, who you are, why are you trying to take their clothes off, why I'm in this cold room here is, is, is a horrible place, don't touch me, I'm fine, I don't need this, I don't like you, you're every person on the show. And goes down from there, right? So all those interactions can be helped with the softness of the caregiver. So the approach that we give is absolutely essential. So I would like just to point out a few, a few items here. And on, on the second page when it says, on the bottom it says, try these communication techniques. Avoid, first of all, check this out. Avoid asking questions that rely on memory. They are under severe stress. They can't remember everything, anything. Their, their handicap is not being able to answer questions. They
case of memory. And here we are asking questions. Where you come from? Who is your mother? Do you have a wife? Do you have siblings? Do you have children? Um, where's your house? Things like that should never be brought up. Keep the conversation on the moment. Keep the conversation pleasant. If you are lucky enough to find out some things that the person enjoys on the background, that would be the most desirable. Uh, at Villa and I, before a person moves in, we ask a lot of questions about the background. Where did you grow up? You know, names of your siblings, names of your children. Where did you go to school? What was your first car and what team of football do you cheer for or even what other sports do you like? Travels you may have liked, what hobbies, what's your profession? All of that information is already on the file. So when we need to find an approach, we can start talking about the football game and then they relax. They feel a connection with you. Remember the biggest fear is abandonment. If you can establish a connection, they will gravitate to you. They may not remember your face the next day, but if you talk a subject that they like, they will continue engaging with you. But do not ask anything from memory. Do not try to reason with the person either. You know, explaining to them that they need to take a shower is not going to work. Explaining to them why they are here, it's not going to work either. They want to go home. They will be asking you, I want to go home. I'm going to get out of here. And what we can do in that case is relate. I know. I know you want to go home. I want to go home too. And the doctor will let you will let us know when the right time to go home. In the meantime, continue working on your recovery. You're doing so well. Provide compliments. Make sure they feel good about themselves. But don't try to reason. It's not going to work. Don't express your anger or impatience. And it says here verbally. I say more than verbally. Don't express that you are angry or impatient with your body, with your tone of voice, with your eyes. Try to keep your smile, try, try the best you can to keep your voice soft and gentle and avoid moving too fast around the person. Slow down, take your time because all, all those signs of your frustration they can pick up. They don't know why, why you're mad or angry, but they know that you are impatient, that you are angry. And they pick up on emotions because that's all they have. They are living in an emotional world. Speak slowly and speak very clearly. Um, they, they have a processing time different than people with a normal functioning brain. They need a little more time to understand what you're saying. If you have to repeat it again, that's okay. Give them time to understand, and then you repeat yourself. And when you repeat yourself, don't change your words. So, I'm Luciana. How are you doing? I'm here to help you with your let's see, bandages. I don't really know what you guys do. <laughs> but I'm here to help you with your bandages. And let's suppose he does not understand. I will say that again in my same words. I'm here to help you with your bandages until that sinks in. Because if, if I move around, oh, your bandages can be changing. That's a complete different set of information. They are not going to get it. So you go back to the beginning, and, and they, are, they can follow you there. So I'm here to help you with your bandages as many times as necessary for that information to sink in. Approach the person slowly and from the front. This is really interesting. 
As we get older, our field of vision shrinks, declines. So younger people, if they stretch their hands and look forward, they can see their, their fingers wiggling. And as we get older, that field of vision it starts shrinking and becoming more focused. So older person and also people with dementia, they have a very reduced field of vision. And many times you see, you're talking to them, they don't get it. You have to be right in front of them, right in that field of vision for them to get. So if that's the case, if I'm approaching, let's suppose you're my patient, and I'm approaching you, how I'm in, within your field of vision. But if I approach her from the side, and she's looking that way, the moment I get within the field of vision, I'm already too close, I'm startling her, I'm scaring her. So that approach is not gonna work because I'm already startling her. And if possibly, if I'm approaching her from her, uh, never from her dominant side at all, because that startling will cause, and it's almost involuntary, they will hit you, they will hit you in the face. And they will hit you good if you stand with them. Never from the back. Avoid from the sides. Preferences from the front. That makes a huge difference. Um, repetition. Uh, we talked about that. Repeat as many times, but don't change your words. Stay with the same words. And allow time for a person to respond to direction. You say, um, Mr. Jones, we're going out today, so please put your socks and shoes and, and, and pants and we'll, we'll be going on our way after you brush your teeth. And too many things to do, too many things, one at a time. May I help you with your socks? Ask permission. Remember, again, the loss of control is a trigger for people with dementia. Ask for permission. They will normally be very thankful that you're there for help. And tell them what's going on. If a person comes into the room, picks up a whole bunch of clothes, and takes it out to the laundry, they are thinking you're stealing from them. They don't know what's going on. Just say, Mr. Jones, may I take your laundry? They will say yes. Of course they take my laundry. Or if they say no, you come after five minutes and say, Mr. Jones, may I take a laundry? And this time they'll say yes. That's that too. If whatever approach that you're using doesn't work, let go. Come back and do it again. If you do it anyway, you will provoke the anger. You will remind them that they are not in charge. They, they lost control. So our approach means absolutely everything. Limit choices. I've seen people breaking into tears because there were more than two <coughs> choices. So um, food, food if it's plated is better, no choices. Do you wanna wear the jacket, the sweater, or the shirt today? Too many choices. So I got this pretty blue shirt for you to wear today. It's gonna look so beautiful in it. Let's put it on. Limit the choices. Choices are confusing and cause agitation. And give clear directions at every single step of the way. Well, in long-term care settings, and sometimes a person will be here for a long time, uh, uh, when they have dementia. If possible, to keep the same staffing because they will be able to recognize just a few number of people. If we have like 30 people passing by, they don't know, they can't memorize anything. 
but a few people too I think they will be able and we will know that there will be a few of the staff members that can develop a little more personal relationship with the patient. And discuss, oh, discuss what works with your colleagues because you might find out that something really works to connect to that person. We just sing, uh, uh, recently admitted somebody at the Lama who is a beautiful singer and she comes down immediately when you start singing and then she continues singing. So if I share the information with my colleagues, I am time that she's a little more afraid or agitated, just start singing and things will go a little uh, much more smooth. And she, I am helping my staff members by sharing that information so they don't have to be frustrated in finding it for themselves. And we never know what happens, uh, what works for one person and doesn't work for other. <clears throat> Always a gentle and supportive approach. If you come giving orders, it's not going to work well. Again, the person is agitated, afraid, and concerned about the loss of control over their own lives. But I think that works for all of us, right? But for patients with dementia, it's essential that we ask them for permission and we encourage them. Day, what happened yesterday, 
was yesterday, and this person will never going to remember that. And today, what happens today, again, will depend on your own approach. So come in with a big smile, announce, say your name, be kind, and start from scratch. Because they don't hold resentment. We do, but we can't with them. It doesn't work like that. Is that making sense? Yeah. Yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Any questions? No. <clears throat> what you were mentioning about with, you know, uh, to um, remain calm, you know, with the patient, that, like, I work at the front desk, mm -hmm. and if we have somebody who's very, very agitated, and they're saying, I'm getting out of here, and they're going to the front door, well, I have to go to the door to keep it closed, and so I am next to the resident. So it's hard to, you know, to keep my distance from them and to keep the door closed at the same time. But, you know, I, I just wonder what you suggest on Well, that. It's, it's the safety of both of you uh, imperative at this moment, right? You mm -hmm. cannot let the patient, this is the patient we're talking, right? We, you cannot let the patient alone because they're going to get hit by a car, right? right. They're on the street, right. they're not going to go far. But you don't want to put your body and your person at risk for, so you have to make sure that door is locked at the time and never put yourself between the patient and the door because it's going to hit you. He's going to hit you to get to the door. You know, we stay always to the side and let the person think that they can move freely and ask for assistance from your, from your colleagues. Use the phone, step back. If the door is locked, it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah, but fortunately our door doesn't lock from the inside. So fire doors, so you can lock. You can lock the door, huh? How often does that happen? <laughs> So you need to call for assistance right. before he gets to the door. <laughs> <laughs> do, do not walk with your body because it's going to hit you. It's not going to work. Right. Yeah. When you see them coming, just call for assistance yes. right away. And and maybe you can think ahead if you know who the people are who are roaming and trying to get out. Treats work beautifully. So having at your desk some treats to distract them. Um, the best treat to distract anybody with dementia is indeed ice cream. But it would be hard to have ice cream on the desk. Uh, I would have I would have chocolate on the desk. Or I would have a phone and say, your wife is on the phone for you. They do like this and go straight to the phone. So if they should know who the patient is, what are the triggers, and what are the things that make them feel good? So a call from the wife could help, a treat could help. Don't put yourself in front of him, never.